Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Oktai. I'm the executive director here at the Center for Coastal Studies. Mark has been working here since a wee child doing <laughs> coastal geology. He's our senior scientist and coastal geologist uh, department chair. And he's the director of the Seafloor Mapping Program. And our marine geology program is actually the largest program here at the Center for Coastal Studies with nine staff and so. three to five students um, and uh, probably 20% of our budget. So um, Mark didn't just wander here. He received a bachelor's of science from Tufts University, a master's from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and a PhD from the University of Rhode Island. And his research interests include coastal sedimentary processes in general, and understanding how storms, sea level rise, and anthropogenic impacts affect the coast in particular, as you'll be able to see tonight. You're going to get a crash course in how sea level rise is affecting our delicate system here on the tip of the Cape. His recent and ongoing research includes mapping the seafloor in shallow coastal waters less than 10 meters, studying bed forms and sediment transport in the near shore, understanding the morphodynamics of the tidal inlets, as well as coastal evolution on multiple temporal and spatial scales. He's also the director of the Coastal Processes and Ecosystems Lab, or CAPE Lab, which is a joint research uh, effort between he us here at the Center for Coastal Studies and the School for the Environment at UMass Boston. And he also works with and is associated with the Stone Living Lab, which is a new consortium of different research entities working with the National Park Service, Boston Now, UMass Boston School for Environment. And we're very proud of him. He's got all kinds of great toys. And he is the expert on what's happening with coastal erosion here and has learned from uh, greats like Graham Geis and many others. So thank you so much, Mark. Thank, thank you, you all for being here. Thank you. There we go. So quick talk outline. We're going to talk about sea level rise, past, present, and future, just to get some context. And we'll talk about the coastal storms. This is the big topic, obviously, the January 2018 storm versus the December 22 storm. I want to talk in detail about flooding in Provincetown and then what we can do going forward, right? We've been, I've been here since 2009. We work with the town a lot. We work with the outer Cape towns a lot. Um, and it's really, a, it's really a pleasure uh, to, to have the science applied, right? So we do the science and we can work with the towns and, and we do a lot of work with them. So start off with sea level rise, but first, it's always easy to pick on the media, so let's do that. So there was a report that came out last February, last year. Uh, this is the title, this is the headline in, in New York Times. Uh, Coastal sea levels in US to rise a foot by 2050, study confirms. No, it didn't. That's not what the study did. Came a little All bit right? close, I mean, Boston, uh, Boston, Boston came Harvard. a little bit closer. Northeast is likely to experience more than a century's worth of sea level rise from 2000 to 2050, report finds. Closer, much better, right? So this is the actual report. This is a big deal. It's a lot of work. And this is the sort of take home messages here, right? So what we have here is um, I just highlighted and underlined the important pieces. Multiple lines of evidence provide increased confidence, right? regardless of the emissions pathway in a narrower range of projected regional sea level rises, global national regional sea level rise at 2050. This report was all about reducing the uncertainty. That's all it was about. We're getting better at the projections. And that's really, really important. And that's not a headline topic, right? But getting better at uncertainty, getting better at understanding it and quantifying it is really, really important. So when we make predictions, we can be more confident in those predictions. And that's just really important. It's, it's sort of the, the, the underrated, unappreciated work is reducing uncertainty, but it's really, really important. So, um, so again, New York Times study confirms. It didn't confirm. All it did was the uncertainty got better. Likely to experience, much better. Likely to experience. More likely to experience would have been even better, right? But Boston Globe nailed it on this headline. Now, headline writers are different than the articles. Both articles summarized what was in the uh, report pretty well. But if you only read the headlines with the first paragraph, you get in trouble. And a lot of people read the headlines, right? Okay, we're gonna talk about sea level rise, obviously. So really quick, the main contributors to sea level rise, groundwater, subsidence uplift, ocean changes in ocean currents, uh, increasing temperatures and melting uh, ice. There's a difference between global and relative sea level rise, right? So we're gonna talk about both really quickly and we're just gonna spend like five minutes talking about sea level rise, but it's important to understand that there's relative sea level rise here in the Northeast, sea level rise is rising faster than the global average, unfortunately much faster, 
Um, and then again, when you think about the IPCC, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, those reports largely have to do with global sea level rise, but in the last couple, they've been getting more regional, which is more interesting. So when you hear a number like that, you should be aware whether they're talking about the global sea level rise or the regional. So this is Boston, one of the best tide gauges we have, right, from the 1920s, and there is a trend, clearly a trend here. It's going slowly up. It's only about two, three millimeters a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on average, it's about a foot a century, right? The last 100 years or so, sea level rise has gone up about a foot a century. Louisiana, Grand Isle, Louisiana, much higher rates. Now, how can it be higher? How can sea level be rising higher in Louisiana, right? Now, this is it's not, you're not one of my, this is not a class I'm giving, but, but I can see this. Ground level. Yeah, very good. This is relative sea level rise. Global sea level rise is doing the same thing more or less everywhere. This, the ground is subsiding and there's compaction uh, in, uh, because of uh, groundwater extraction, oil and gas extraction, and just compaction, right? So the ground is lowering while the sea level rise is going up. So you see a greater sea level rise here. Oh, I see. This is how I knew it was going to be a right crowd. All right. Oh, did I put this backwards? No. Sea level fall. Alaska, we actually have places where the sea level fall. This is upsetting. So if you ever hear about people that the climate skeptics, oh, well, sea level's falling in places. Yeah, sea level's falling. So the sea level was falling at a faster rate in Louisiana because the land was going down. Sea level rise is going down because the land is going up. Why is the land going up in Alaska? 20,000 years ago, right here, what was right where we are. It's a really thick ice sheet. It was about a quarter of a mile thick, right? Quarter of a mile thick of ice. Now, if anybody's ever gotten on and off a raft in a pool, you get on the raft, the raft sinks. Get off the raft, comes back up, right? So this ice, this, this thick layer of ice was like us sitting on the raft, but the raft is the, is the actual Earth's crust and it sinks down a little, right? And then as, as it melts, the land slowly comes back up. In Alaska, the ice sheet was about five miles thick. So it's still coming up. It's coming up so fast that sea level in parts are actually falling, right? Skagway, Alaska. Alaska is so big that in most of it, it's actually rising, which is really hard to get your brain around. That's how big it is. Most of Alaska, there's a sea level rise problem. But in certain places of Alaska, there's actually sea level fall. But it's just for fun. That's how I have fun. Okay, um, but the trends are clear, right? The trends are clear, sea level is rising. Um, and, and we can see that happening. When we talk about this, they can't predict, when I get a facial twitch when somebody says this, they can't predict the weather next week. Uh, what do they know about the climate in 20 years, right? I hear this a lot. They can't predict the weather. How can they predict the climate? This is a figure from the 2013 IPCC uh, report. And what they did was they went back to 1991 and they said the first report was in 1991. They said, how did we do? We predicted things in 1991. They went back and looked at it 20 years later. How did we do? Well, they did pretty good. The IPC in red here is the actual tide gauge measurements. In 1991, where the gray starts, those are their predictions. Okay, That, the blue and the red is what the actual is. So in 1991, using a computer that was much weaker than the phone you have in your pocket, we nailed it. And it was at the high end. The reality was at the high end of the predictions back then. We're really good at this stuff, right? Really good at it in a lot of different ways. This is a CO2 model. We did this not going back to 1991, but going back to 2001. How much CO2 will we be burning, right? All the different colors of the different scenarios, how much we're actually gonna burn uh, in, in, in percent of CO2. And then what, what are we seeing? The black is the actual, okay? So again, at the higher end. And a matter of fact, above the highest of the, of the, uh, of the different scenarios of burning CO2 or fossil fuels. So we're good at this stuff, right? So now the latest IPCC report comes out and it's more the same, unfortunately, but this is the sea ice one. This is the one that gets most people, I don't know what the word is, uh, engaged, maybe. So this is September sea ice. Why September? Because that's when the warm, the water's at its warmest, right? So you want to look at an extreme. If you're going to look at it, you don't look right in the middle here, you look at the extreme, the water's at the warmest. So we look at the sea ice and we look at the predictions. That's from, again, 2001. The black is the actual. We're at the bottom end of those predictions. So just in the last 10 years, we're getting better at sea ice modeling too. 
And again, we're at the bottom of those. And there's a trend, there's a wiggle in the line, and that's fine. That's natural variability. But there's 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 a trend that tells us that the sea ice is going away much faster than we had thought. Um, now we go locally. This is a really interesting one. This is done by Greg Berman. He works for Barnstable County. So uh, for all the local taxpayers, thank you. Greg's a rock star. He's really good. He looked at the, the data from the tide gauge in Woods Hole. This is a little closer. Um, so we look at the, the tide data, and we look at the from 1933 when the Woods Hole uh, tide gauge started to 2021, 88 years, and the sea level rise is about a foot a century, right? That, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're seeing. Same kind of number. But, uh, oh, yeah, let me just run through these really quick. The different colors of the different scenarios, right? We go from low all the way to high. So you can see the different ranges there. There's a lot of information in the slide. The solid line is the gauge, the actual thing we're measuring, right? That's the black squiggly line to the left of the line. And then you have the uh, observation extrapolation in the dotted line. So assuming everything stayed the same, right? And then we have uh, more data here, the linear trends, the full record, and post-2000 and pre-2000. And pre Mark, when yes. you say scenarios, do you want to explain what you mean? Sure. So these are worst cases. So these are when we talk about low, intermediate, 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 high, and high. These are different rates of sea level rise. What if sea level rise did this? It has to do with how much CO2 we're burning and other factors about ice melt and things like that. But these are just the low end of the sea level rise over this period of time versus the high and everything else in between. Thank you. Um, so again, we have a century's worth um, but a, yeah, about a foot every century. But if we keep looking at the data in more detail, over the last 50 years, the rate's gone up to 1.2 feet a century. And over the last 20 years, from 2001 to, to 2021, it's gone almost doubled. So that rate is starting to go up and it's not linear, right? It's going up faster. It's not a straight line and you can see the curves up here. So that's interesting. Now, part of this, again, part of this is natural variability. There's always gonna be natural variability but the trends start to you know, repeat themselves and intensify. So we just wanna keep looking at it. And there's that old you know, saying, you hope for the best, prepare for the worst kind of thing. The worst case scenario, unfortunately by 2100 is eight feet of sea level rise. So I'm saying eight to 10 feet of sea level rise in 2100. Well, that's a lot, right? It's 2023, that's a foot a decade over the next 80 years, rather than a foot a century. Now again, it's not gonna be linear, it's gonna take off. And it's going to start going fast. So that's the worst case scenario. But when we look at the uh, projected models, right, the last from 1991 and 2001, we're usually at the high end of that. So that's, some, that's the subtext that we want to think about um, as we go forward. <laughs> that's my sea level rise bit. I'm going to talk about coastal storms. This is the fun stuff, as far as I'm concerned. But first, a quick quiz. Uh, a blank foot rise in mean sea level, MSL, mean sea level, would enable a 10 year storm. That's a storm that occurs on average every 10 years uh, to flood areas that today are only flooded by a hundred year storm. All right? What do we think? Half a foot, one, two feet, three feet, four, well, no, three, four or six. Think about it at home. Anybody want to, anybody bold enough to take a guess here? Throw out some numbers. A. 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 Half a foot. Anybody else? Half a foot. Dennis is a little low. It's actually a foot. Yeah, sorry. It's a foot. But what does that mean? That again, that means <laughs> that means um, that was what was the rate of sea level rise over the last hundred years? About a foot. So you put those two facts together. Right? A storm that used to occur once every hundred years, based on that, is now more likely to occur every 10 years. Yeah. Right. And these are all statistical averages. Doesn't mean you're going to get, and it doesn't mean you get a hundred year storm every hundred years, obviously, right? That the likelihood of the storm, storm occurring in any given year is 1%. That's a hundred year storm. The likelihood of a 10 year storm happening every year is 10%, right? But there, it's, it's meaningless and less because everything's changing faster. Um, okay, so this is a NOAA website. We're going to zoom in on this data, but this is, this is really useful data. The, let me just read it off of here. The blue is the astronomical tide, so it's predicted. The green is what actually happened. And the purple is the difference between the two. So that equals storm surge for our purposes, right? This is a storm. So it was supposed to be this high, and then it got to this high. And then we go, we look at, we can mouse over this really cool data site, NOAA data site. So you mouse over this. This is the big storm, the storm of record, January 4th, 2018. Um, and it was a predicted storm. I mean, there was a predicted of 12. 
flat. And then there was a verified of 15.1. Here is a little higher, it's 15.3. Uh, but it was a three foot storm surge, right? So the storm added three feet of elevation to the uh, surface of the ocean. And most importantly, when did the storm surge peak? That's critical. It peaked at high tide. If it doesn't peak at high tide, we're not talking about the January storm. It doesn't happen if it doesn't peak at high tide, right? But uh, parenthetically, the, the blizzard of 1978 was about four or five inches lower uh, than the 2018 storm, okay? So the 2018 storm was a little higher. It was a few inches, three, four inches higher. 1978, 2018, that's 40 years. About how much sea level rise happened in those 40 years? About four inches. Same amount that the 2018 storm was above the blizzard of 78 was about the same amount that sea level rose. So if sea level hadn't, rose, hadn't, hadn't gone up that much, we might not be talking about 2018 the way we are. Um, and we know about 2018. I love these two pictures. I'm taken from the same plot. All right, this one's taken this way. This person who took that picture is standing right there. It's a nice picture. Part of this is obviously drainage, right? Uh, it didn't drain. That's a whole different story. And that's going to be part of the story that we're telling tonight. But, uh, but there was water everywhere, right? This is a big, big storm. So now um, we go to the December storm and we do the same thing, right? And we look at the storm surge, 2.3. It was lower. And this is where the story starts getting interesting um, because this is why we're here. In 2018, the, the total water level was 15.38, right? And in this past storm in December, um, the total water level was 13.8. It was about a foot and a half lower where we're seeing more flooding uh, in the East End with this past storm. Right, so that's the anomaly. That's what we can't figure out. That's what we couldn't understand to begin with. That was interesting. It's like a little mystery, right? We don't know why that's happening. Um, I keep telling my daughter, science can be fun. This, this is, it's interesting to figure this stuff out. Now, you guys are year-rounders. There's really cool resources you have here. There is a tide gauge on Macmillan Pier. It's run by the USGS. Thank you for your federal tax dollars. And that's really, really good because it helps us with these, with these really accurate uh, um, uh, predictions. So they have what they call gauge height, right? If you add five and a half feet to gauge height, then you get mean low, low water. So when we talk about 13 and a half, 14 and a half, 15 and a half, if you just add it to this tide gauge, that's in real time, they take a, a reading every 15 minutes, you can look at these data. Because there's this tide gauge, the National Weather Service has really, really good predictions for what happens in, in, in Provincetown, really good. And it's in real time. So you can go to their website. I just did this at four o'clock. This, this was real time, four o'clock. This, we were 300th of an inch away from being in the action stage. Now, what does the action stage mean? It means just that, start getting ready, right? So if you're 300th away, 300th of an inch away from the action stage, you should probably get ready. And I can guarantee you the folks in town knew this because they watch this and they keep an eye on this. So it's when we start to have minor flooding at 13, that's when things start flooding. Right. The National Weather Service has worked with us, like very, very closely with us. When there's a storm, they called us in the 20, after, not on the 24th, but after the holidays, they called and said, what happened during that storm? Where did the flooding occur? Where did you see it? Because they want us to tweak their models all the time. So when you have this kind of information, um, this is what the National Park Service, uh, the, National, the National Weather Service can provide for you at every elevation, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 in Provincetown and Truro, they have these really nice specific uh, uh, directions or, or instructions about what could happen, where the flooding could actually happen. They name roads, they name parts of town, they know where this, this area is. Now, this is the National Weather Service office in Boston or it's in, it's in Norton, knows about these roads in, the, in your towns because this tide gauge is here because they're doing this real-time total water level monitoring, which is really cool. Not a lot of towns have that, and you guys do. Um, so it's really, it's really a powerful tool. Again, all kinds of information, that's where that tide gauge is. You can actually go and look at the tide gauge, right? That should maybe be a stop on the tour when you go to Provincetown. There's kind of right there. Um, and then this historic crest. Now, this thing has only been around, the, the tide gauge has only been around since 2014, end of 2014. So if you look at historic crests, there's not that many that are that old because it hasn't been around that long. But when you look at them and you start to uh, look at these and start to, because again, we want to we figure out why 
this happened? Why are we seeing why are we seeing all the flooding in the East End this time and not and not in 2018? These are the two storms you're talking about, right? Well, if these are the two storms we're talking about, why aren't we talking about the other storms in the middle? Right? So you got the other two storms. If you remember March 2018, that sort of period of time where it seemed like the tide didn't go out, it was always high. There were always high tides, and the high tides were really, really high. Two of the highest tides in this in the last seven years, eight years, have been in that March storm. I mean, that March period where we just had, you know, high tide after high tide after high tide. So that was really interesting. Um, the other one. Let me skip the other one here. This is only, again, two hundredths of a foot lower than the one we just had. This was in January of 2018. 2018 was a rocking rock year. It was only two hundredths, but we didn't see the flooding. Didn't see the flooding in the East End, even though the, the, the water levels are pretty much the same. Okay? And then there's this, oh, and then there's the, my, one of my favorites. Oh, boy. One of my favorites here is this one. Um, 2015. 14 feet, 14.3, really high, 2015. You don't really think about this storm that much, but this is why it's interesting. This is why I like to show it. So again, we're looking at this information. Now, when did the storm surge peak? Peaked at low tide this time, right? That purple line of storm surge peaked at low tide, but it was a massive storm. It was a foot and a half higher. The storm surge for the 2015 storm was a foot and a half higher than the 2018 storm. So now when you start to do the math, you take the 2018 storm of record and you add the 2015 storm surge and it's a foot and a half higher than it was in 2018. So everywhere you saw water in 2018, you add a foot and a half of water. It would have been devastating. As bad as the 2018 storm was, another foot and a half of water, Promise Town would have looked much different. And these storms aren't that rare. And that's why I show this. They're not that rare. It's all timing. If it happens on a spring tide, if it happens at a high tide, when you have these peaks at the right time, you have these massive storms. So if these storms get more and more frequent, then you're more and more you're more and more likely to have these things line up, right? So that's why we're, that's another why another reason why we're paying attention to this stuff. Okay, the West End story. I cannot come up with a better title, but but it's better than why did the East End flood in 2000 and, uh, in 2022 and not in 2018? So this is the story that we're telling. These are the two storms. These are the two water level elevations. This is a foot and a half difference, right? Uh, little to no wave action in 2018. Now, if you guys remember 2018. It wasn't that many waves. It was relatively quiet at high tide. It, it wasn't very, the water was pretty flat and it wasn't that wavy. There was a lot of wave action in December. Very, very, a lot of waves. And we're going to talk about that. So again, January storm, East End, very little flooding. Uh, and the East End, uh, lots of flooding. Did I get that? Yeah. I'm always doing this backwards. So the West End, there was lots of flooding in 2014, but not so much this time. Now, part of the West End flooding, not so much in 2022 is because the town did some things. Right? The town took some actions and they were ready for the storm. So you know, credit should be given to the town. They actually put some, uh, uh, some I don't know if it was portable flood walls or, or dunes or berms or that kind of thing at Ryder Beach, right? places where they knew it was low. They actually took some steps and they prevented, I think, very likely they prevented some flooding from happening. So it was a little better, but it still doesn't answer the question of why we didn't see that flooding in 2018 when it was so high. So what is, what's the issue? We know there are waves. And we're going to talk about that. Seiches was thrown around for a while. We were trying to figure this out. Is it just a matter of erosion? Uh, but there's a lot of walls, a lot of structures. Was the change in structures, right? So what is the what are the pieces of the puzzle that tell us why this happened? The storm. Me, yes. Seiches? Yeah, we're going to get to seiches. Seiches. A seiche is a standing wave, right? When you're in the tub and you push the water one way and it just does this, right? We're going to talk about those. It's a, it's a really phenomenal. So when scientists get confused. Kind of go back to mama and we try and figure out an answer that makes sense to us. And a seish works. A seish makes sense. And I'm going to explain it, but it's really, it's rare. But it, but it made sense. And for a while we were going, yeah, I think that's it. I think it's what it is because it makes sense. But it's not the simplest answer. And sometimes, again, the simplest answer is, is more, off, more often than not the right one. So the storm's coming out of the south, right? So it had a, a fair amount of fetch. And these waves kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and as you go further along, uh, the waves come into the harbor. You have the hook that's doing a lot of the protection. You have the wave attenuating barriers, right, that are doing some of the protection. And the bulk of the flooding happened right here, obviously. Right? So, okay, it's really shallow here. So the waves would have got attenuated. You wouldn't have a lot of waves breaking up in here because it's so shallow. And as when the waves impinge upon the bottom, they break, right? That's why the waves break. So that is, you know, in a nutshell, that's why there were a lot of waves because it was coming in the right direction. There was a lot of fetch. So that as the wind is blowing on the water, that's what fetches. 
the, the distance that the wind is blowing on the water, and because it was coming out of the south southeast, it had a long time to blow. So kind of worst case scenario in terms of waves to promise down harbor. So if it was waves, this is the high tide, right? This is your classic high tide, and this is the this is the tide gauge in, at McMillan. Tide came up slowly and it went down slowly. These readings are every 15 minutes, right? So it's unlikely that this was just related to waves. Because here's the other thing. If, there, if the waves are pushing the water up so high that it was going over the 15 feet that we saw in 2018, the water eventually would have sloshed over to the west, right? It would have sloshed over to the other side of the harbor, and we'd see it in the tide gauge. You could have maybe six inches, maybe you know a six-inch ele different elevation from the east end to the west end for a little while, but that water's going to run downhill eventually, and it's going to move over to the, to the other side. So if it was really a foot, a foot and a half higher, what, if it was above that 2018 of elevation of 15.3, you would have seen a signal here. It wouldn't be this smooth going up and smooth going down. You'd see something that shows us a foot difference, right? These are two feet. There'd be a big spike somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my, my uh, units didn't come across on this one. But so this is the 2018 one. I'm sorry, that was the 22 one. And this is the 2018 one, same kind of signal. And you can see that's okay. So here you see it's every two feet, these little bars. So this is what it looks like. There were no waves on this one, 2018, and there were waves on the, on the previous one. Let's go back. Ooh, the wrong way. Yeah. So no waves. I mean, a lot of waves, no waves. That tells me it's very unlikely that waves are the only factor. Now, waves are crashing over. You've seen these beautiful images, well, powerful images of waves going really high up in the air. See, for me, it's beautiful. Uh, really, really high up in the air. But that doesn't put a lot of water. You think about the East End Market. That doesn't put that much water there. Waves breaking over these walls don't, doesn't put that much water. Um, so the wave thing, six inches, sure. Did it go up to, it was 13.8. Did you go up to 14, 14 and a half? Sure. Did it get over 15 and a half? No way. Couldn't happen because we'd see it here. So it's very unlikely. Now, I'm going to show this video over and over and over again. Uh, this is Finitzi's. I want you to look at this. He zooms out and he zooms out again. But this is Finitzi's. That's, see that water coming out here? Water coming out here? Steady. About 10 or 15 seconds. If this were waves, there'd be a pulse. If waves were feeding that water, think about the driveway of Finitzi's parking lot. It's not that, it's not that big. It's not that long. And there's no basin. It's kind of, and we went out there and shot it with the GPS. It's, that's the high point at the edge of the parking lot, and then it slowly slopes down to the road. That water there is not driven by waves. Now he's going to zoom out here. This Holland Street. Okay, so you've got to zoom out and zoom out. I'm going to show you here. When he zooms out, now that I'm waiting for it's long, one more, and you're going to see the water pouring down Holland Street. Look at that. It's coming from this way too. That's not Holland. It's not Holland. No, that's no, the, the side. I think it's Holland. Uh, it's Hancock. Hancock. Sorry. H. H. Yes. Thank you, Hancock. So yeah, so you can see the water pouring down here, and it's coming from two directions. And this is not this this amount of water. Well, it's very very unlikely this is supplied by waves. This well, has to be water pouring in. Yeah. I'm back. That's my property. Okay. okay. Now I see water in the parking lot is low. Is that could that be a reason for that the water is coming so much? So when you mean to say the seawall is low, the seawall that was on the deck. Came and the, the deck came off. Right. And that was, yeah. So, I mean, that's part of the problem. Wall, sandwich. Yeah. If that was better, higher up. So, you didn't, like I said, the, so what, the thing you remember is for you is that uh, in 2018, did you see water going into your in your driveway? Just like, just like this. Okay. But it, but it, was, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a foot and a half higher. It was, it, it was up to the top of the poles in front of the restaurant on the base there. On the bay side, okay. Yeah. But I mean, just, so this is like an, a couple inches of water. Do you think you had a foot of water, foot and a half of water there? No. Okay. Yeah. So I think it had to do with the wall, right? I think I think the wall failed, it got beat up, and, and then and then this happened. And you're the and we walked into your parking lot. Sorry, we walked into your parking lot and shot it with our GPS, and it's right around fourteen and a half feet, fourteen point five, fourteen point four feet at the at the furthest edge we wanted to go. So now that's not making sense. Again, if we're talking about thirteen eight, thirteen nine, and we push up the water because of the waves. Now we're at 14 and a half feet. That makes sense. Now that now that makes sense to me. Seeing that water there, I'm okay with that. 14 feet. Um, okay, next one. This is what waves look like. This is what water looks like. This is a really short one. This is Laura's video. It's really short. I'm just going to keep playing. Um, so the waves are breaking over, and then you see the wall. The water goes down, right? 
waves break, the level of the water comes up so much you can't see the wall anymore, and then it goes down. It's mirroring Mars. Okay, so that's what waves do. Should keep playing, sorry. And I had to stop shooting video because I was parked right in the middle of the road and people were trying to get by me. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> just want to play one more time. I don't play for me. Okay, well, you get the point. It's not playing for me. No, it's not playing for me. All right. So again, waves, a little waves, yes. Half a foot, a little more than half a foot, yes, but not a foot and a half. Clearly not a foot and a half. A seish. What is a seish? A seish is just a standing wave. Again, think about a bathtub, right? You, if you look at the middle of the bathtub, the ball stays right here, the rubber ducky stays right here, and the water goes like this, right? If there's a lot of water pouring into the east end of the harbor and the water getting pushed up, the water's getting pushed up and pushed up because of the waves, that water has to go west at some point. Now, if enough water happens, if enough water moves in that direction, a seish could start to set up. And it's rare, and it happens. And I wish Graham was here because he's the expert, like literally. If you look under the Coastal Encyclopedia for seishes, he wrote the entry, right? <laughs> literally. Um, now, I don't think it's a seish, but sitting in my little you know, uh, uh, ocean, uh, oceanography course from 20 years ago makes perfect sense. That answers the question. The water gets pushed up, and then it starts doing this, and then you can see it. But, but you wouldn't see that on the, on the tide gauge because it's at the node? No, no, you would see it at the tide gauge. You would still see it at the tide gauge. It's very unlikely that that's good, that's good for you. You must have a science background. Um, <laughs> no, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, so kind of like a seesaw. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. It's like a seesaw. Very good. What's the period of the station? Are we talking minutes or an hour? Two hours later than five minutes? It can be. That's another another extra question. You have a science background too, or something. Um, it, 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 it it varies. It could be minutes. It could be hours. It actually could be days, wow. depending on the body of water and how much water is happening and how much the variation is happening. This, because it's a storm and the wind's not blowing that long, even though it felt like that long. First, it would have to happen at high tide. Right, the stage should have to happen in high tide. You only got about half an hour for it to happen anyway, so you're probably because you know on either side of high tide, for it to you know push that water up above with that 13.8. So it's unlikely that you'd get it uh, for the for a short duration that the waves are pushing. And there's so many ways out of Providence Down Harbor. It's not like one way in, one way out kind of thing. It's kind of wide open. So if that water were getting pushed up, pushed up this way, it would have slowly went that way. And even if it did come back, there's more water coming here. So it really was not perfect for a seish to set up, right? When you start looking at the physics. So it's very unlikely that it's a seish too. And now we're running out of answers. And we don't like to run out of answers. Um, okay, Suzanne's garden, right? There was some, there was a lot of flooding in Suzanne's garden for those of you who don't know. Uh, this is one of the spots. So Steve and I, Steve McGee and I went out and we looked at this area here. Now, the first picture is gonna be taken from this. We went out on the beach. And this is, this is one of the things we saw right across from Suzanne's garden. They're rebelling the house. They've raised the house up, right? I'm gonna play this video with any luck. This was given to me by the carpenter, working in, you know, working in there. Very, lots of waves, not huge waves, by the way. These are four, four foot, five foot waves, but they're big, big for Provincetown Harbor and a lot of energy, a lot of damage. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, this, is a, this is a very um, developed sea. You're not going to get much bigger waves given the short amount of fetch. So thankfully, what he does next is really, really cool. He walks to the other side of the house, okay? He stops filming. He walks through the house and goes to the street. I love this guy. <laughs> And he knew what he was doing. He's talking about it as he's, I don't know why we're not getting audio, but he's talking about it and he knows what he's going to see. Oh, yeah. It's going right underneath the house. Mm -hmm. Right? It's going underneath the house. And you're going to see he'll pan for a second. He's going to pan over to the left and you get a sense of how deep the water is because you see a car. Right there. Okay? So you get a sense of how deep it is. Not that deep. It's only a few inches deep, but it's salt water. Right? Okay. This is what we're talking about here. This house is raised up because they're doing work on it. Had to be raised up to do work underneath it. And interestingly, it's going to go back down. This, there's some sort of historical exemption. I don't know exactly, but this is only temporary. It was built, um, you know, the first story was installed. It was just a one-story house. Now it's a two-story house. Oh, okay. It'll, it'll come back down. Okay. Yeah. So we went out and we got shot. Even if this house was on the ground, you can see there's rack line on the sides of the house. 
almost every house in Provincetown has that little path between it, right? Water's going to flow here if it can get here. And that's just rack like you would see on the beach. So in other words, water was pouring through here to his wells underneath. Um, and again, this is temporary. I literally did this to remind myself. This is temporary. So that's interesting. So you have Suzanne's garden, which got nailed. It's a low spot if you go on that road and the water came from here. The house was raised up. Now, um, and this is just for fun, because again, you can have fun. If you don't have fun, you're not doing it right. So now I'm looking at the beach. I want you to look at this area here. I'm gonna zoom in. We blow it up. This is from Google Streets. That, that we can look at underneath the, the waterway is that. You can actually see where the water's gonna go. No LIDAR, no drone mapping, no aerial mapping is gonna help you, right? The only way you're gonna see this is if you're walking the beach or you're, you know the area, that's it. So the best map in the world from the top is not gonna help you. You literally have to walk it to see it. Same kind of thing here. That's the water, right? That's the water right in there. You, know, you can see the water right there. So this is Provincetown. You guys all know this, but for those of you who don't, right, this is what the town is like. There's all these houses and they're all jammed pretty close together. So now this is 509. This is uh, right next to the out, uh, Ice House. Who said outhouse? Ice House condominiums, right? There's a church here, St. Mary, Mary's, right? St. Mary's uh, parking lot. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at this area right here. And again, I'm going to show you a picture standing right here. Oh no! Actually, this is this is the aerials first. So this is Google Earth May 2016, yeah. right? So I always like to keep an eye on the rack line. A rack line is like a contour line of the map. It's the same elevation, right? So you can tell a lot about where the contour line is. You can tell what the land does in between here, because that's the same elevation. So it's a contour. Rack lines are fantastic. Little, little contours, right? So we, we go ahead in time, uh, May 2016, and we go October 2016. And I just wanted to, so we're going to be looking at this area in particular here. The nice big dune right there. It was over 16 feet in 2018, the magic number. It was over 16 feet. The 2018 storm was 15.38 uh, feet. This dune was 16, right? And again, you see the boat here. Keep an eye on that boat, not going anywhere. Rack line's a little different. Water line's right up against the wall there. That boat's still there, right? Hasn't changed all that much. And that's the last one we have, October 21. And then now the rack line is right up against there. Rack line's changed depending on what year is and what the beach is doing. But the thing you remember is that when you have a wall on an eroding beach, the erosion either keeps eroding or it erodes faster. It doesn't move landward anymore. It goes down. You lose elevation. That's how beaches with walls erode. They go down in elevation, which means at high tide, you don't have a beach, and if it happens long enough at low tide, you don't have a beach. Now, you're going to have a beach at low tide because it's 10 feet tide, but your beach gets smaller and smaller as the years go by when you have that wall, especially with sea level rise. All right, so now we're looking in here, right? We're looking at this house that has been raised up by, I don't know, seven, eight feet. We zoom in, we get a little closer. Now, this is what I want to draw your attention to. That's where the dune was. This is three or four feet. That dune was here for a long enough time to start rotting this wood. It was here for a long time and now it's gone. What we think is, and this is what we call a storm deposit here. These are heavy minerals. This is an indication that there's been a lot of wave activity here. I don't wanna get too much into it, but if you have sand here and this really heavy, uh, they're called heavy minerals, they're more dense. Those like magnetite and garnets. The wave energy will keep this stuff in suspension. The regular silicolastic sand made of quartz and it can't keep that stuff in suspension because it's not strong enough. So the sand keeps getting pulled out and that's what's left over. And the thicker that deposit is, the longer the storm happened. But just seeing that there tells me it's a storm deposit. A storm very likely, very, very likely ripped up that dune during this time or what was left of it. So now what happens? There's nothing stopping the water from flowing underneath the house, right? We look at, the, we pivot and we look to the left. Oh yeah, actually, sorry. I don't know if you can see this here, but this is really rotted. Again, looks like this. The dune was that high. There was a fence there. There was a fence there. Mm -hmm. And the dune, like I said, that was buried because the dune, because that, that you can tell from the wood. When we pivot to the left, you can see the same thing on the side of the house here. That's where the dune was. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is where, what we're looking at now. This house has been raised up. Uh, and this is evidence of water flowing through here and bringing the sand with it. All right. It's covering up the little shell, shell, oh, I don't know, driveway or path or whatever. 
So this is another indication of what's going on here. Another video by Ludwig. Hang on, Let's see if this one. So we're walking into that same area. That's the house we just looked at right here. And we can see all this material here. And we see that. So there's a ton of water here, right? Another low lying area. And again, you go down Commercial Street, you're doing this when you drive down Commercial Street, right? It's high, it's low, it's high, it's low. Where's the water gonna pond? It's gonna pond in the low areas. All it needs is a way in. And all it needs is one way in, right? We know that it went through uh, 509. And we also know that a lot of it went through the Ice House Condominium parking lot, a lot. Because that, it, and it's kind of a, I don't even know what to call it. It's like a, it's like a, a this, this, like, it's not sand, but it's like fine, fine grain stuff. And that's that. So all this material moved through and came on shore. Parenthetically, the way coastal uh, environments keep pace with sea level rise is like this. <laughs> if you let that stuff here, now the street's that much higher. <laughs> yeah. If you All right. So what we're seeing is in a few places, in low lying places, water got through. This is the storm tide pathways. Um, uh, website. We talk a little bit about it, but if you look at the four places that we've looked at where water's coming through, and where where the water is, those low spots, this is a pretty good map for the flooding that happened in this area, and it's just based on lidar, right? Just based on that lap. The pathways are different now because some houses have been raised, um, but that's what we're seeing. This is the answer to why the storm in 20, uh, 2022 flooded in areas where the twenty eighteen storm didn't. Is that your prediction, the red? No, that's just if you raise the, that's that's the light arm. If you raise it up to a certain elevation, that's where the water goes. So it's just a low lying area. So it's, it's kind of a prediction. Where the, where the well, I didn't make these data, so I just, I mean, oh. this isn't mine. Yeah, these are mine. This is NOAA data. Um, so yeah, so this is just a map that's online that you can look at. So this is that story right now. The last piece of it, oh, I'm going long here. Um, I mean, I'll just cut the last just a little bit and just go to the end. Well, don't skip out. Um, what happened? All right, I've been going for a while. All right, I'll go for a little while. Well, so no, so now we're gonna we're not talking. There's no more no more visual stuff anymore. Now, I mean, there's no more stuff from the storm. Now we're gonna talk about what to do next going forward. And I just want to talk really quickly about the storm type pathways and how we um, and how we did them really quick. So if people who don't know. Sarah mentioned I'm the director of the seafloor mapping program here at the center, and we have this really cool data visualization software. So what Steve McGee and I did in 2015, 2014, 2015, is we started this idea where we would take these data um, and start to do something different than what, what was out there. This is surging seas. This stuff is online. You can see this stuff. It's really useful, climatecentral.org. But when they map areas, they map them by state. Right? They'll do the state of Massachusetts. and they'll do, they'll do the state of New York. They'll do the state of New Jersey. And I, I half jokingly say they map state by state, we map street by street, right? We, we literally go out and we go to all these places where we're finding these areas. This is grayed out because this is as close as you can zoom in. So when we saw these data, we said, you know what, these are useful, but they're not super useful because you can't even zoom anymore. So what we wanted to do was uh, use the same data that everybody else uses, uh, but using our software, we start to uh, look at things in a different way with more resolution. So we take that LIDAR data, which is a three-dimensional surface, and then we drape our uh, aerial photograph on top of it using the software. So now the, the, uh, the image is a three-dimensional surface. So now we zoom in downtown Provincetown and we start to raise the water up using the software that we have. No hydrolog hydrologic connection yet, right? But we can cut a, a profile through this like you do slicing a cake, right? And as we raise the water up, we can identify the point where, gonna be, where the water is gonna flow. That's a storm tide pathway. If you stop the water flowing there, you stop this area from getting flooded, right? This Ryder Beach. If you stop the water here, you stop all of that getting flooded, right? Now, this report came out in 2016. Um, and what I tell people is I said, keep your eye on the flower pot. Um, that's 2018, right? That's the January 4th, 2018 storm. That's Gosnell, the cross between commercial and Gosnell right there. And this is salt water flowing from the harbor. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of water. And it's a little before high tide, so the water's gonna keep coming up. This flower pot's slowly making its way across the, <laughs> across here. But I, I sh this one's a little more jittery, but he's gonna to turn toward the harbor and it's gonna stop. And this is what I wanted to show you. We're above the bottom of the doors now. And look at the harbor, right? It's not, it's not really energetic, it's not a lot of waves, but it's really high water here. Right? This was the highest, this is the storm of record. So 
we have these data, we understand where the water is going to flow, when it's going to, when meaning at what elevation is it going to flow? Um, oh, storm of record, sorry. So the storm of record, and I've said this a couple of times, thank you, is the biggest storm on record, the biggest storm that we have. It used to be the blizzard of 78. And then the blizzard, uh, the, actually it is the blizzard of uh, January 4th, 2018 is now the new storm of record. It was literally four inches higher than the old storm of record. So for most of Massachusetts, the storm of record is 2018, the January storm of 2018. So we have these data sets that we came up with. We give them to the towns. Uh, you get all this information. That's the elevation that this area will flood at, right? So when you look at the storm, when you look at the National Weather Service forecasts, you know when water is going to flood here. Um, we go out and we shoot each one of these with our GPS to make sure we're very, very accurate. We don't, we don't uh, count on the LIDAR. We go shoot it ourselves. We use the LIDAR to guide us to those areas. Um, they're good for storms, town uses for storms, but they're also good for uh, climate change and sea level rise. So what we call secondary pathways. This entire neighborhood here gets flooded through one spot, right? This storm tide pathway. Um, another interesting one, uh, this area here, right where Nappies is, floods by one spot. So Nappies doesn't flood that neighborhood or that area doesn't flood coming from the harbor, it goes all the way around. Now this, that's counterintuitive, but this isn't gonna happen tomorrow, right? This is with sea level rise, but, this could be something as easy as when you, um, you know, pave a road, you could go up a little, right? This is, these are capital plans. You think 10, 20 years in advance, but you can start to figure out what you're going to do when it happens. So this is Storm, this is the Storm Tide Pathways website. And this is, this is what we saw down. You can go on this and, and fool around with uh, the different settings. You pick your tide gauge for you guys in the Provincetown, and then you change the levels. But I just wanted to talk about, the last thing I'll talk about here, this is the West End. This is 13 feet, mean level water. That's six inches higher. Right, six inches higher gets you from there to there. So um, let me just go back here. Sorry, show that again. Six inches, an entire neighborhood gets flooded, and we're seeing that kind of sea level rise now. So when we talk about six inches of sea level rise or a foot of sea level rise in really flat areas like Provincetown, it makes a huge difference. So this is why we want to get ready. This is why we want to be prepared. Um, and so the last thing that I was asked to do is, what do we do? This is my last slide. We were talking about the say, I think it would be really, really important for the town to do a storm report when we have a storm like this. One month, you get one month and you just put just bullets. Where was the flooding? How did it happen? Collect all the videos, um, and do the crowdsourcing, get all this information out here. When people, I mean, Laura was our little storm watch team this time. She went all over town taking these videos. I used half of them in this talk, right? They're really, really useful for scientists. They're really useful for understanding. Because in 2018, I don't remember where, I was here and I don't remember where everything flooded. Having a storm report from 2018 would be really, really helpful. And the turnover in town staff goes fast. Having a storm report, you can look back and go, oh wow, it flooded here and it flooded here and it flooded here. We know this now for December, 2022, because we just saw it. We just, you know, I know it. In five years, I'm not gonna know it, right? So having a storm report would be really useful. Working with the National Weather Service, if we worked with the National Weather Service and said they had these kinds of waves in the harbor, coming right out of the Southeast and we saw this kind of flooding, they would love that and their model will get better. Their model for predicting flooding in Provincetown will get better the more information we give them. And that's an open invitation because we talk to them all the time. Um, the site by stuff assessment is really important. That's why I showed you that look through underneath the porch. We can do all the mapping in the world, but the site by site stuff is really, really important. Um, and even if it's temporary, right? If there's an increased risk because you're raising a house uh, for six months or three months, when do we do construction in Provincetown? Winter. When do the storms happen? So even if it's temporary, you're increasing the risk temporarily. So you should be aware of it. That water flowed. Uh, and again, it's a temporary permit. Oh, it's, temp it's important because the risk is there, right? And you're increasing the risk of the people getting behind, of, you know, of water getting into areas where they normally or they previously wouldn't have gotten because of a simple thing like raising a house. Um, and then lastly, yeah, do I want to do the storm type pathways uh, map and update it? Because we did it in 2016, the promise done. Yeah, of course I do. But it's not the, the last thing you can do, right? It's not the only thing you could do. It's a good start. But the on the ground surveys, those are the gold standard. Because you walk through and you, you literally, if you're paying attention, you can't miss them. I can do the best drone flight I can do. I'm still going to miss those ones that go underneath houses. So these are the kinds of conversations that we should start having about what to do next. Because the most interesting thing is that the houses that were raised up because they had like 50% of their damage done, like 50% of the value of the house was, was seen in that kind of damage, right? They have to raise their house up. And the town has to, has to tell them to raise a house up if they want national flood insurance. 
right? If the town doesn't do that, then the town could be disqualified from the National Flood Insurance Program. The town doesn't have a whole lot of choice. So it's not really the town's fault, right? Um, it's something they have to do, but the conversation should be had of when you are increasing the risk of someone in the second row of houses, what is your responsibility, right? What is the town's responsibility? What is the state's responsibility? Like who's doing what? Because the idea for FEMA is to raise up all these houses eventually. So that's the conversation we're going to start having. And I think it's an important one. Um, and that's why I think this kind of stuff, looking at each individual storm when they're big like this is important.